Greetings everybody and welcome back to another video. This is like my third time filming this video already because every time I've filmed it I keep getting audio problems which is like really annoying. Um, but yeah, what are we taking a look at today? We're taking a look at this nice little theorem. It says that conformal automorphisms of C are linear. So there's a bunch of words in here which we may not know what they mean exactly yet. Um, for example, what is conformal and what is automorphism? Maybe we'll start off with the more common word, I guess, which is automorphism. Um, what is an automorphism? An automorphism is just a function that takes you from a set back to itself. It's also bijective and it also has to preserve some nice property. Um, so maybe in group theory, you may have heard of group automorphisms before. So those are the bijective group homomorphisms and that preserve the group structure and so on. Um, now in this case we're working with C here, so we're thinking of functions from C to C. Um, so what is automorphism in this case? Well, I'm going to denote it by this set which I'll call ORT of the complex plane C here. And ORT of C, it's going to consist of all maps that take you from C into C, um, but we also need that F has to be bijective, so we have F first of all, it's bijective. Now, we also wanted to preserve some nice structure, I guess, and um, also nice property. And what's a nice property of functions on the complex plane? Well, differentiability. So we also want F to be differentiable, or entire is another word for it, because we're differentiable on all of C here. So we want F to be differentiable. Now, it turns out F being differentiable is not enough to make F an automorphism, because we also need the inverse to be differentiable as well, because it needs to preserve that nice property both ways. So you can say, well, F inverse is differentiable, but it's actually enough to say, well, F only needs to be what we call a conformal map, which is the other key word I have in the theorem there. So it has to be conformal. So the set of all these such functions, this constitutes the set. Ought C, and I might use that notation in future videos as well. So we've got one of those big words out the way. How about conformal? Well, I haven't done a video on conformality or anything like that before, um, but roughly speaking, what conformal maps do is that if you have two lines that intersect in your input space, then you map it over to your output space, the angles and orientation of the angle is, is preserved. And it turns out that analytic functions, um, well, on, at least on the domain where they're analytic, they're conformal, so they're preserved angles. So that's one of the nice properties of analytic functions. And it turns out a function being conformal is equivalent to saying that its derivative is nowhere map vanishing. So f prime of z is never equal to zero. So this is something you can prove. Maybe I'll prove it in another video. Um, but if your derivative is nowhere zero, then you can say your function is conformal. Okay, and essentially what the theorem is saying is that all these such functions that live in this set over here, they must be linear. So they're of the form um, az plus b. So maybe I'll write it down over here. So this is the same as the sets of all functions az um, plus b, where a is a complex number. Um, now it can't be zero because if a is zero, then then you're talking about the constant maps which aren't linear, and B, well, that can be any complex number you want, pretty much. So that's a set of all those linear guys there. So that's basically what the theorem is saying. Now, how on earth do we go about proving this theorem? Well, first of all, we need a little proposition that's going to help us very soon. So I guess it's a, a fun fact, or I just guess I'll call it a proposition in this video. So prop, what is the proposition? Um, it turns out if you have a function f, so if f is an entire function, then either one of two things happen over here. So one, um, f has an essential singularity at infinity. So we can say infinity is an essential singularity. So that's one thing that can happen. And another thing that could happen is, well, f is just simply a polynomial. So I guess I should say then either um, this guy or, uh, or the second case happens. So you can't have both at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. You either have infinity as an essential singularity, or your function is exactly a polynomial. All right, so this is going to help us a little bit. Maybe you can roughly see why, because we want to get to these linear maps over here. So in particular, we want to show that these functions, they're polynomials, first of all, and maybe we want to eliminate the possibility that they're essential singularities, and that ties back to um, the Cassarati bias theorem, which we proved, um, yeah, a few weeks ago, actually. So what's the proof for this theorem over here? So proof, it's actually very simple. And um, so if f is entire, then you can buy the Taylor series expansion for it. So let's say f of z, that's the sum. And we can center it anywhere because it's differentiable anywhere. So let's say at zero, so you would have something like n is equal to zero up to some big n of a n z to the um, 
n, like so, right? And we're going to assume that, um, yeah, a big n is not equal to zero, just so if your sum goes up to big n, then it's a polynomial of degree n, and if this n over here is infinite, then it's not a polynomial. It actually has infinitely many terms, right? So we can write our function this way. Now there's two cases. If, let's say, n is less than infinity, and um, well, if n is less than infinity, it's pretty obvious this is a polynomial. So f is a, um, a poly or a polynomial. Um, now how about if n is infinity? Right now, n is equal to infinity is a bit more interesting because what you can do is, well, first of all, the sum has infinitely many terms. What you can do is you can study the function f of 1 over z instead. So what would one over, f of 1 over z look like in terms of a Taylor series expansion? Well, actually, it's not a Taylor series anymore. It's going to be a Laurent series because now, what well, we still go from n equal to 0 to infinity now, it's going to be a n, but now you have z to the minus n. So you have negative powers, this is a Laurent series, and if you've watched my Cassarati Weierstrass theorem, um, the first video, we discussed some classification of our singularities. So if we have a Laurent series and there's infinitely many of these negative powers, then well, here at z equals zero, where we're centered around, that's an essential singularity. So because there's infinitely many terms over here, what we can say is that z is equal to zero, is an essential singularity of the function, well not f of z, it's f of 1 over z, because it's of this Laurent series expansion here. So um, yeah, of f of 1 over z, and this is equivalent to saying, well z equals infinity is an essential singularity of just well, normal f of z. Because if you want to analyze the behavior of z equals infinity of your original function, that's the same thing, or that's equivalent to analyzing the behavior of f of 1 over z, so you put the reciprocal inside, um, at exactly 0. So yeah, hopefully that's clear there. So we know that z equals infinity, that's an essential singularity, but only if n is equal to infinity. So these are two mutually exclusive cases here, and yet they give us the two results up here that we want from the proposition. Right, so that's the proper done, and now on to the actual proof of the theorem. And this is going to be a proof by contradiction. The idea is we're going to assume that we have an essential singularity and show that a function fails to be bijective. And yeah, there's a really nice way of doing that using Kasserati bias for us. So let's take a look at the proof for the theorem. So first of all, we notice a few dot points over here. Let's suppose we pick a function f from ought c, right? So we're going to let f be an element of automorphisms on the complex plane. Um, then what do we have over here? We know f is entire, um, and we also know f prime of z is not equal to zero. Right, because it's a conformal map. And but we also know that f inverse exists, but we don't necessarily know that f inverse is, well, differentiable, right? But it turns out you can use the inverse function theorem to say, well, if your derivative is nowhere zero, that means your inverse function must exist. So I believe it has something to do with the determinants or J Jacobian determinants, um, and the determinant is nowhere zero because of exactly this condition over here. Um, so locally, you can invert your function, so that's roughly where it comes from. So we know that f inverse is differentiable, but we actually don't really need that fact, that's a little too strong for what we need, and um, we only need the fact that f inverse is continuous, so that's really all we need here. So the inverse is continuous, that means when you map things back from the w to the z plane, it doesn't tear sets apart or anything, and that's a pretty important property that we need, topologically speaking. All right, so we know f inverse is continuous. Now, let's take a look at our function f a little bit. So we know f is entire, which means using the proposition, it's either, it either has an essential singularity at infinity, or it's a polynomial. So we want to somehow get to f being a polynomial, and we're going to do contradiction, or use contradiction, and we're going to suppose that f has an essential singularity, at z is equal to infinity. All right, so suppose this is the case, then what can we do? Well, we want to use Kasserati bias for our theorem somehow, and here's how we're going to set things up over here. Um, we're going to imagine, well, here's our um, z plane, if you want, and then here's our w plane over here. Now, what we're going to do, um, let's pick your favorite complex number, w naught, let's say. So, let's say w naught, so that's lying somewhere over here. So, this is w naught here. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct some nice little open disk around here. Right, so this is this that's going to be d um, centered at 
w naught with a radius of, let's say a radius of epsilon, so yeah, some epsilon radius over here. Right, so our function, it maps us from this plane over here. So this is the function f. Now what we're going to do is we're going to grab this neighborhood and we're going to map it back via the inverse function. Right, so we're going to take this guy, we're going to map it back over here. So this is f inverse. And what we're going to get, because f inverse, we know that's continuous, it's not going to tear things apart or anything. Um, we also know that this set over here is bounded. Right, so f inverse is continuous, which means when you map things back over here, um, the resulting set should also be bounded. So this set over here, so this is blue, this is the set which I'll call s over here. So what we're doing is we consider um, some w naught in the c plane, and then some disk d um, w naught comma epsilon, and this set we know it's bounded. So now we're going to let some new sets, let's say big S over here, and B defines to be the pre-image under the function F, so essentially F inverse, of this set over here, which is a D bar W naught comma epsilon. Right, so that's this S that we have over here. And this set, this is also bounded because F inverse is continuous. Now, what exactly does it mean for a set in the complex plane to be bounded? It means that you can find a disk with some finite radius where that set in question, which is S, can fit inside. So in particular, you can think of this picture. We can think of, we can think of some bigger disk over here. So S is not necessarily a disk, it's just some blob in the complex plane, but it's bounded so it sits inside some bigger disk. Um, let's say a closed disk, which we call D bar, and then zero R. So we're gonna take it centered at zero for simplicity, and then we're gonna say it has some radius R. Right, so continuing on on, on this side, this implies that there exists some big R greater than zero for which S is a subset of a D bar and then zero R. And now what we're going to do, let's take the complements of this set of D bar zero R. So consider um, the complements, so C, but we exclude this D bar zero R. Right, now what exactly is this? This is actually a neighborhood of infinity and you can think about it, it's clear if you think about it on the Riemann sphere. Um, so that's what I wanted to draw. So here's the Riemann sphere over here, right? So here's the point at zero. And then up over here, this is infinity. So what we have so far, sorry, let's make it look a bit more like a sphere, not a circle. What we have so far, we have that set S, which is kind of like in the middle there. It's, so maybe it's lying somewhere down here in the Riemann sphere um, in, in some way. So this is your set S originally, right? And what we did was we found some big radius R, let's say, um, yeah, up over here now. Where the disk, so the, the red disk, you should think about it as being below this red line over here. So this is um, D bar and then zero R. We found some disk that encloses that set S. And now if you take the complements of that, well, that's going to be everything above, right? So that's going to be um, everything above over here. That's going to be a neighborhood of infinity. And infinity, we know that's an essential singularity, right? So we have this setup so far. So what we can say is, well, by the Cassirati virus for us, theorem. Well, what does the Cassirati virus for theorem say? It says that uh, for every neighborhood of your essential singularity, um, you can map arbitrarily close to any complex number you want. Well, we picked a complex number W0 over here. Let's take that as our pick. So there exists some number, let's say, yeah, let's, let's say it's right over here. Let's say Z1, which maps arbitrarily close to W0, um, but that's equivalent to saying there exists a Z1, which maps inside of this disk um, D, W, naught, epsilon. So let's write that down over here. Um, so we have, there exists some Z1, which lies inside the neighborhood of infinity. So that's going to be C excluding D bar zero R, such that our F of Z1, this goes into, um, well, where is it? It's, um, yeah, D of W naught epsilon. And now you see a bit of a problem here because every single point inside this list, it already had a pre-image inside of S, or on the Riemann sphere down over here, right? So wherever this point lands, so wherever Z1 goes inside of this, this, um, there was already a pre-image in here, inside of S, because S contains all the pre-image. So let's say right over here, there's some other number, Z2, which also maps arbitrarily close to exactly that point um, in your disk there. Uh, yeah, something, something like that. 
but there exists some z2 that's already in S um, such that f of z2, that's going to be equal to f of z1. Right, so we have a z2 and a z1, and these are coming from two disjoint sets, so this is, should be clear. So since S intersects, if you intersect it with the neighborhood of infinity, so c bar, so c d bar 0 r here, um, this is empty, what we can say is, well, f fails to be injective. Right, so f um, is not injective. And f not being injective, that's a very big contradiction because we assumed um, from the start that f had to be from this set ought c, right? And ought c, um, those are bijective functions. So that's a contradiction. Where did the contradiction come from? It came from this assumption that we suppose f has an essential singularity at infinity. So therefore, f can't have an essential singularity at infinity. All right, so that means f has to be a polynomial, right? So therefore, f is a polynomial, right? And that's really quite nice because now we're one step closer to knowing that f has to be linear. So once f is a polynomial, it's really quite simple to see that f has to be linear. So we did some more steps over here on um, blackboard number two, right? And we came to the conclusion that f is a polynomial. Right, so f is a polynomial, and um, in particular, the degree of f, well, that first of all can't be equal to zero, because if f is, because if the degree is zero, then you're a constant, and if you're a constant, you're not even injective anyways. And furthermore, we know that the degree of f, if it's greater than or equal to two, then it's not injective, so it can't be greater than or equal to two. Now, why is that the case there? It's because if you, Think of the fundamental theorem of algebra, if you have a polynomial of, let's say, degree n, um, if you can always find some points where there's multiple solutions, or at most n solutions, right? So at those points, your function's not even injective, which, mean, which is why your degree of f can't be greater than or equal to 2, because if it's 2 or more, then you, it's possible to have, um, yeah, two solutions or more solutions, let's say. So that's no good. So, so therefore the degree of f has to be one, but if the degree of f is exactly one, then f is linear. And that basically completes the proof of the theorem. So f is linear, um, which means it has this form a z plus b. So all the possible functions you can have in the complex plane in which um, preserved angles, they're bijective and they're differentiable, they have to be linear. And so there's two complex degrees of freedom over here. There's the a that controls scaling by the modulus of a and yeah, rotation by the argument of a. And there's the plus b over here. Well, that's just the translation. So the real and imaginary directions and so on. Um, so yeah. Hopefully there's a nice Desmos animation playing there for you guys to see um, what it looks like. You can also think about this as four real degrees of three of them, so, so you can only have rotation, scaling, and the two translations. And your A can't be equal to zero, otherwise you swish everything down to one point, and that's not um, invertible or anything. So yeah, that's all for this video pretty much. Nice little theorem. And next time we're going to take a look at the set ought of C bar. So we know ought of C is linear. How about if we include the pointer at infinity, what happens if we um, put a bar at the top over here? And it turns out those are our Mobius transformations. So those have the form AZ plus B, but we divide by CZ plus D. So we'll take a look at that in a future video and some more um, Mobius transformation videos in the future as well. And so yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and up until the next one, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone later. Bye bye.